Well, I've actually managed to be a minute early. That's uh, definitely a bit of a change, bit of a surprise. Um, welcome to the most authentic voice in somewhat true crime. In this episode, we're going to deal with Adnan Syed, and um, we're going to kind of investigate this idea of a narrative that emerges that starts to dictate another narrative. So a narrative emerges, in this case, serial, a social media narrative, which then ultimately does it dictate the actual legal narrative? I don't know the I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know this case well enough to know whether that happened. But we're going to think about that and we're going to look at that. And in terms of that question, this image really stands out to me. You see the newly freed Adnan Sayed doing the victory sign, and I'm not, I'm not sure if it's victory or peace, <laughs> but um, he's surrounded kind of by cell phones, and it's really um, social media that played a big role in courting the, courting the court of public opinion, didn't it? So that's what we're going to be talking about. I want to kind of book in this discussion with this particular article. It was first written in December 2014, and it says, Serial reveals how much more we care about justice for a man than the life of a woman. And we're going to come back to that. So keep that thought in mind. Okay. Just a quick hello to you guys, Karina, Sageti, Norna, Sharon, Sharon says, I've needed to hear your voice today. Uh, Leah says, I'm just two hours into your life from yesterday, and I want to applaud you for taking a stand in truth and critical thinking. Appreciate that, Leah. Uh, Donna Barnes says, uh, Nick, hello. Thank you. Thank you always. <clears throat> okay, so... Something I noticed just while I was preparing this was um, this particular slide. Let me bring it up. It's actually the same uh, composite image from HBO. But have a look at this. It's uh, the timeline. And have a look at this section of the timeline. It says, J. Wilds leads detectives to Hayes' car. And then Adnan Syed is arrested. Now, just that, again, as I said, I don't really know this case very well. But the fact that J. Wilds knows where Hayes' car is, is a sign that he's quite intimately aware of the details of this case, because that would be something very few people would know. Interesting, isn't it? Okay. So you guys know what has just happened. Adnan Syed has been um, freed, and the um, situation now is that the prosecutors have dropped the appeal. So, so he's now home and away is 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 free right and and that then raises the question if he's innocent why why doesn't he sue for wrongful arrest because sorry wrongful imprisonment so he uh, was released because of a wrongful conviction and do you think a wrongful conviction equals wrongful imprisonment if it does then he is due multiple millions of dollars in, in restitution, right? 
So let's do a quick poll with you guys. Do, do you think that wrongful conviction equals wrongful imprisonment? So just looking at the poll here, uh, almost 60% say yes, that, that that does mean wrongful imprisonment. So if you're right, then he should campaign, he should start preparing his lawyers to to sue right now. Um, you know, he stands to um, he stands to gain millions of dollars, right? And has he announced anything like that? I mean, how would you feel if you were wrongfully imprisoned? You you you're innocent, someone accused you of murder, and you're in prison for you know 20 years or more. Um, would would you be wouldn't you be angry? Wouldn't you want some kind of compensation for the injustice? So um, I know I would. So the question then is, is he campaigning for and, and going to start suing for wrongful imprisonment, begin that legal process? And then the second thing, um, the social media that was responsible for getting him on the radar shouldn't they also be campaigning for the same thing? I mean, because he's he's innocent, right? So um, let's take the next step. Is uh, you know he needs to to earn multiple millions, and obviously the social media can maybe benefit from that. Maybe they can take a couple of million as well for their efforts. It's a it's a money making jackpot, and uh, you can only win. It's a win win situation. So. If it's so simple, why don't they just do that? Are they doing that? Are they doing that? Alina says, I'm not that familiar with this case. Uh, do you know why I was convicted in the first place? Um, sorry, that is a too long, uh, too long a, a question and an answer. Um, I suggest you Google Adnan Syed Wikipedia and go and familiarize yourself. Uh, Karina says, what if he's not innocent? Uh, absolutely, you would you would be, sorry, Joan says, you would be shouting from the rooftops that you're innocent and one compensation. So we do see this particular um, image of him doing that, obviously pleased to be free and surrounded by also supporters, you know, they, they are cheering his freedom and celebrating his freedom as well. Uh, but where's the indignation? Uh, where's the anger that I was, you know, I was wrongfully imprisoned for a crime I didn't commit, right? Uh, to Helen Beck, good to see you. So that is um, on the far right there. That is the victim. And her name is Heyman Lee. And the thing that I want to emphasize is from this article again, it says, Sarah is the story of who killed Heyman Lee, a Baltimore high school student murdered in 1999, right? <clears throat> Except Heyman Lee is dead and so is unable to speak and her family declined to participate in Sarah Koenig's investigative podcast. So instead, Cyril is the story of Adnan Syed Lee's ex-boyfriend and the man convicted of her murder. In every episode, the first human voice we hear after the recap is Syed himself saying his own name. Whether by default or design, he's the star. The question Cyril asks most insistently is not who killed Lee, but did Syed do it? And I think there's another way of saying that. Syed didn't do it. That's what they're trying to say. They're, trying, they're asking the question, did Syed do it? But it's another way of saying, 
I think he didn't do it, right? The question that they're not asking is, okay, so who did kill um, Heyman Lee? So it's not investigating the murder of Heyman Lee. It's investigating all the possible reasons why the murderer might not be guilty or the alleged murderer might not be guilty, right? In other words, it's the defense case and it's a fixation on the defense case. It's not really trying to solve a murder. It's trying to unsolve a murder, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so let's get going. The last time I looked, it was the job of prosecutors, but sometimes it seems, sorry, it was the job of prosecutors to prosecute, but sometimes it seems um, prosecutors see their role as finding reasons not to. I think it speaks volumes, the silence of Heyman Lee's family in the face of the ruckus surrounding this case. I think the cacophony of social media should be seen in the context of the victim's family having absolutely nothing to say, and also the victim's family not participating in this podcast. So let me ask you guys a question. If the serial podcast and if, if social media was doing justice for this victim, right, actually helping to solve her murder, why would you imagine if family wouldn't be intimately involved, wouldn't care about it? Instead, you've also got to ask why have they not been involved, right? Okay, so I'm going to just do this. So I'm going to need to put my, my eyes are a little bit strained today. I'm just going to be reading from, from the screen closest to me. So according to WJZ, Lee's family criticized Mosby, saying they feel shut out of the justice process. What if I can uh, bring that up? Okay, so I'm just going to play a quick clip. Let's see if I can do, do that. Just a second. Um, present. Um, share screen, but also want to share the audio. Share system audio. Okay. Okay, let's see if it works. Can you guys hear that? Did you guys hear that? Okay. Okay, um, so... I do think this is where we are in true crime today. It's not really about truth or justice. It's giving the public, that's the online public, the verdict that they want, and they got it. In this case, they got the verdict that they wanted. And I do want you to think about those of you who have come from the Kylie Rodney case. I do want you to come from that case into this case and think about the idea of a big, a high-powered social media machine that starts to influence a narrative, gets the outcome at once, dictates the narrative, controls the narrative, and then you actually have an outcome. And in this case, you have a, a, a significant legal outcome where someone convicted of murder becomes unconvicted of murder, right? That's the, the power potentially of dictating a narrative, right? And then you say, um, no, it's harmless. It's just speculation. No, it's not. Um, it's just somebody's opinion. No, it's not. Um, it's the difference between someone's life behind bars till the end of time or not. And that's a big difference. Also, it's the difference between someone who should be spending life behind bars, potentially, and, and then they end up not, right? So by reducing the crime, 
so in this case, by reducing the crime to whether DNA was present or absent, all that was required was to show there was no DNA. Hence, there was no crime. No DNA, no crime. Well, unless you Heyman Lee, as far as she's concerned, there was a crime. As far as she's concerned, she experienced a crime. She experienced pain and violence and death. As far as she's concerned, there was a motive, there was a suspect, there was somebody who took her life. There was a fabric connecting her to a particular perpetrator. As far as she's concerned, the only thing that's changed is that Heyman Lee is dead and there is simply now no murderer, no motive, no fabric connecting what happened to her to a perpetrator. In other words, it's now an unsolved murder, and that seems to be okay with everybody. That seems to be okay with everyone. So let me uh, bring this up. Uh, let me bring that up. It's not about Adnan's innocence. It's about the state's case. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think that that is a, a true statement? Is it not about Adnan's innocence? If you look at what it says here, serial reveals how much more we care about justice for a man than the life of a woman. I don't know. It kind of seems to me like it is about Adnan's innocence. I don't know. Uh, Brits Creek says the serial podcast came to a pretty neutral conclusion about the case. It gave Adnan a voice, but it wasn't explicitly pro Adnan in my uh, in my opinion. So, so what? So, um, not quite sure how to respond to that. So, so it wasn't explicitly pro Adnan, but it gave him a voice. And it didn't give a vic the victim a voice, and it didn't give the victim's family a voice, but it wasn't pro Adnan. Let me um, let me read this this thing again. Right, Heyman Lee is dead and unable to speak. Adnan is alive and able to speak and able to speak on her behalf and to say what she was thinking, but he's saying it, not her. Instead, Cyril is the story of Adnan Syed. It's not her story, it's his story. In every episode, the first human voice is Syed himself saying his own name. He's the star. And the question Cyril asks is who killed is not who killed Lee, but did Syed do it? And in a weird way, they're kind of saying, I don't think Syed did it, do you? Right? And then uh, Ritz Creek says, it's actually not um, explicitly pro Adnan. So what do you think happens when you give somebody a voice? So in a case where someone is, is um, accused of committing a murder and the person who's murdered is dead, but you give the person accused of committing the murder a voice, what do you think happens? Well, you've seen what happens. This happens. That happens. But no, 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 it's not um, it's not explicitly pro Adnan. Okay. So let me ask you a question. If Adnan himself thought this podcast was going to be critical of him and was going to show him in a poor light, do you think he would have participated? That's it. That is it. Okay, let me continue. So I'm going to just take that away and um, put the glasses back on. So I want to quite quickly just go through the idea 
of making this case a DNA case, right? As I said, I don't know this case very well, but I do know the law quite well. I do know a lot of high profile crimes quite well, and I know some of the intertextual elements quite well. And that's the aspect that I want to address here. And in, in, in particular, specifically, this idea of the Adnan Syed case is a DNA case. And so if there's no DNA, uh, he didn't commit the murder. And also, like, there was no murder. Unless, of course, you're the victim, then there was a murder. But, but in terms of him, if his DNA wasn't there, then there was no murder, right? So if you take that thinking, you take that sort of strategy, and you apply it sort of across the board, this is what happens. If we uh, apply the DNA setup to the Scott Peterson case, Scott Peterson should have been released yesterday because the only physical evidence that was found possibly connecting Scott to Lacey Peterson's murder was a single disputed hair in a yellow needle nose pliers found in his boat. And as I said, it's a disputed hair, so it's not like they found Lacey's DNA. They found a hair that they thought might belong to her, maybe, maybe not. So let me show you the that ne needle nose pliers. Um, to bring this up. What did I do with that image? There it is. So can you see in this image, can you see in this image, there's the needle nose pliers right over there, right? And it's sort of tucked under that section and where it goes underneath that, uh, it was actually clamped onto a, a human hair, right? Now I want to show you another image that's sort of zoomed in of that needle nose pliers. There it is. I don't know if that is a hair, but it, it's not a really great quality image. But that is the needle nose pliers, right? Now, if Scott's DNA wasn't on Lacey, how can you prove he murdered her? Just because he went out on a boat where is that image? Let me see if I can just find it again. Is it that one? Yeah. Just because he went out in a boat, this is the interior of the boat, um, doesn't mean, and just because he went to San Francisco Bay on Christmas Eve, and just because Lacey's body was found in San Francisco Bay, that doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't prove Scott did anything. The only way that you can prove that Scott did anything is if you find his DNA on Lacey. So um, we should really make the Scott Peterson case a DNA case, and, and Scott Peterson should be set free immediately because they didn't find, find his DNA on Lacey. So Scott, free sh Scott Peterson should be set free immediately. Now let's move on to, um, to, to the next case. And that's dealing with this um, good-looking young chap. Anyone know who, who that is? If you don't, um, no one's going to uh, give you a hard time over it. So, obviously, the um, circumstantial dynamic, the circumstantial relationship dynamic um, provides a pretty compelling narrative that is hardly exculpatory, both in the Peterson case and the Syed case. But if we insist on being anal, if we insist, the only way that you can prove that this person did it is with DNA, well, then we can change quite a lot of legal outcomes. So if we want to fixate on that aspect, we can actually change true crime history like that. So let's, let's start changing true crime history. Uh, DNA proved Amanda Knox didn't kill um, uh, Meredith Kircher. DNA proved the West Memphis Three didn't kill um, three eight-year-old boys. And a lack of conclusive DNA proves Madeleine McCann didn't die in apartment 5A and wasn't in a silver Renault Scenic, and, and she's actually still alive. 
In the Henry von Breda case, and that's who this youngster is over here, Henry von Breda, is a young South African man who was accused of axing to death his brother and then both parents with, with his hands. And you might say, well, does he look like the kind of person who would do that? He seems like a really nice young guy. So if, if DNA can't link him to this, then, then, I, then I think he, he didn't do it, right? Karina says, I'm so conflicted about the role of DNA and the importance of motive, right? Okay, so let's get back to Henry. Um, I um, sat in on this particular case. And in fact, if you look at this area here, there were a couple of days where I sat right there. There were also a couple of days, you can't quite make it out, but you can actually sit in this, there's an area here. I also sat there, right? Yeah, what does an axe murderer look like, right? So I was present in this court. I, I was present for the defense, and it's really interesting how the defense took place, right? So um, the crime scene in, in Henry's case was an orgy of DNA evidence. Let me put up another image of, of young Henry. It was an orgy of DNA evidence. And so when I sat in on the defense case, I and, and everyone else watching the trial expected the defense to open with the accused attempting to defend himself, right? That is how we thought that this case would open, would be Henry testifying first, right? Testifying in chief, saying what had happened, saying that it wasn't me kind of thing. And instead he didn't. Instead, Henry's defense case opened with a big DNA narrative, right? And so what happened was, and how can I put this? I arrived in court, and uh, I think in this particular image, what you're seeing is Henry's looking up to the gallery. And there were a couple of times that I actually sat in the gallery myself, and uh, some of Henry's family members did as well. And I was looking forward to Henry testifying because I was writing a book about the case, and I really wanted to get his testimony as part of my book. And so instead, my first day in court, I was being subjected to um, this long drawn out crap about DNA that went on for the whole day, and then the next day, and the next day, and the next day. And this was, the, this was his defense. This was the, the defense case. And although the prosecution ended their, their leg of the case with a, on a very strong note, as soon as Henry's case started, all of that interest totally subsided. The journalists were starting to fall asleep. I was starting to fall asleep. We had an expert talking hours on end about sort of technical details. And it was really hard to um, even pretend to be interested in what she was talking about. It was extremely academic. It was extremely dry um, and dull, right? And so what she was actually doing, so as dull as it was, it was actually quite clever. Um, the DNA expert was laboriously casting doubt on hundreds of DNA samples that she said were incomplete. As I said, it was a clever argument in theory. There are dozens of disputed DNA samples, so that must mean an intruder with unknown DNA could have committed the crime. You've got a couple of uh, disputed DNA samples, so that opens a door that unknown space opens the door for um, the, let's call it the suspicious narrative. Um, I think there was foul play, and no, 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 not, not foul play with Henry, someone else. Um, and now let's start thinking about different suspects. It could be anyone. Uh, it could be a gang that was going around that area at the time. Um, it could be, well, you know, you can just sort of use your imagination. Um, but there's a, there's a little hole there, and you can now fill that hole. You know, you get those things at tourist attractions. You get kind of a um, someone's figure, and then there's a face that's missing there. Well, you can put any face you want to in that 
thing. And that is what the defense are trying to do, which is you created sort of a DNA hole and then you can just sort of fill that hole with whomever you want to put in there, right? And uh, in other words, you are drawing suspicion away from Henry to someone else. Nobody really knows who it is, but but that's not really the point. You're trying to cast doubt. So, so the problem was that there were hundreds of confirmed samples. So. And when you've got enough confirmed samples, why would you test for any more, right? Let me say that again. In an orgy of evidence, and there was like literally a waterfall of blood in this case, there was like blood all over the place, blood all over everybody, right? There wasn't a lack of evidence. The crime scene wasn't cleaned up, right? Even so, you could sort of argue that all the DNA that you could find didn't really mean anything. Well, let's look at the DNA that you can't explain and let's try and see something there um and so the defense tactic was basically to say why do you only have let's say 30 dna samples uh when they are let's say um 20 that are incomplete well i, I guess you could say when you found a, a dna sample should you try and find another 500 when you've already found the sample that you're looking for? And I suppose you could make that argument. You could also say 500 is not really enough. I mean, I think to really make your case, I mean, this was a triple X murder. Maybe you need 5,000 DNA samples. So you could also argue, you know what? Technically, it's not really enough. You didn't really get enough DNA at the scene. And because of that, there's uncertainty. It could actually have been somebody else. You needed to have done more DNA sampling, right? That's the ridiculous argument that they were kind of making, right? Are you following? I'm just I'm trying to make the case for how uh, the legal aspect is sort of being twisted, right? So, as I say, naturally, if your um, if your narrative is only focused on disputed samples, it might feel as if there's a big enough hole for a phantasm to materialize and to become the imputed intruder and murderer. So let me show you guys a couple of headlines that just makes explicit what this is about. Von Breda's DNA expert manipulated data. So quoting from that article, it says, on Wednesday, Galloway, that's the prosecutor, accused Olkers, that is this um, expert, of contradicting herself by criticizing the state for analyzing DNA samples, which she said were below the optimum amount, but then analyzing the same samples herself to contradict the state's findings. Then the judge pressed Olkers for her expert opinion as a scientist, but instead she quoted from the standard operating uh, procedures. So when he asked her a specific question wanting to know her opinion, Instead of giving her opinion, she would defer to standard operating procedures. Here's another article dealing with this particular case. Um, State rips DNA expert CV apart in Van Breda murder trial. Uh, here's another one. Van Breda defense's DNA expert has never worked in a lab. And so what happened in this case was the judge started berating the expert. The judge was eventually became visibly irritated that a report had been compiled after key testimony from state witnesses. And he said, it would be really helpful if you produce your report before you could be clouded by the evidence and what counsel told you. Now, doesn't this the same apply in the Syed case? I'm asking you guys a question, like a legal question. Doesn't the same apply in the Syed case, which is the trial happens, I think 10 or 12 years go by, then a podcast comes along and the podcast knows the knows everything in hindsight. And so you can now come in from the perspective afterwards and you can try and find um, evidence to to play with and to 
to argue, right? You're not, you're not attending that actual trial and arguing the case. You're coming afterwards and you're fixating only on one side, which I guess is the prosecution's case, and you're trying to find what's wrong with it. You're not really, are you going to the defense case and trying to find what is wrong with that? What is not really working with that? So let me put that up again. It would be really helpful if you produced your report. In other words, it would be really helpful if serial came out before all of this happened, before the court case happened, and not with the benefit of 10 years of hindsight, and people contradicting themselves sort of over the period of 10 years, which a lot of people can do, um, where you could be clouded by evidence and what counsel told you. And isn't that what serial did? It clouded the um, court of public opinion with, with evidence, with a narrative. Uh, Mel Stiller, good to see you here. Karina says, I am thinking. Okay. This is a picture of him as a young man. Seems like quite a, quite a sweet, sweet guy, doesn't it? Okay. Right, let's continue. So here's another um, another headline from the Van Bredaal case. As I say, it's a, an orgy of, of evidence, actually. Judge gets short with DNA expert in Van Bredaal case. And here's another one. Was this Van Bredaal's biggest mistake? Read Judge Desai's um, full judgment, right? Now, Here's the point to all of this. Here's the point that I'm trying to get to with all of this. Could you say that this triple X murder case was just a DNA case? So in other words, could you say, let's, um, let, let, let's wipe all of this away. Let, let's just get rid of everything. And you know what? It's a DNA case because DNA is the smoking gun in the 21st century. We can really just ignore everything. We can ignore statements, witnesses. We can just get rid of absolutely everything. It's a DNA case. So what you want to know is in this scenario where, where, where there was an axe murder taking place and there was blood all over, can't we um, find little aspects where the, the DNA was sort of incomplete and then we make that what the entire case is all about? Also, not really where they found uh, Henry's DNA on the victims because, well, he lived there, right? He was, um, he was the son, so, so, so that doesn't really matter. But let's make it a DNA case and let's look at the DNA that we can't explain. So let's make it, um, we can't explain that DNA now, it's really suspicious. Not suspicious for Henry, suspicious for just somebody else. Let's, uh, let, let's, let's concentrate on that, right? Do you think that that would be a, um, a good way of proceeding? Do you think um, looking through the keyhole of DNA is would, it, would be the way to go? What do you guys think? Um, Elsa says, this DNA flood fest reminds me of the OJ Simpson. Definitely, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to, um, yeah, it does look like a, quite a clean cut man. When I wrote the book about him, some of my American readers said, I just cannot believe that he's guilty. He's just so handsome. He's such a nice looking guy. He's so sweet. You know, I would go out with him kind of thing. So um, I've got to tell you, when I last covered trials and I wrote books about true crime, which seems like a distant era known as the Enlightenment, um, we understood that you, you build a case not with a single building block, but by adding multiple layers, pieces, sequences, and forces that come together in a particular irrefutable context, right? And so this is what the judge ultimately said. Let me um, bring it back to that. So this is what the judge ultimately said. I'm going to put this in chat as well. It's so important. He said, each piece of evidence on its own might not be enough to establish the guilt of, I think he was saying, yeah, the accused. In other words, Van Breda. 
but the cumulative effect of all the pieces concludes the puzzle. Does that make sense? One piece on its own isn't enough, but the cumulative impact concludes the puzzle. Um, Deborah says, what is the name of the book, please? Are you talking about the book that I wrote? I wrote Indefensible, that was the first book in the series, and then Diablo, Diablo 2, Diablo 3, Diablo 4. So I wrote five books on this case. Okay, so the most important part there, oh, is it Mel's birthday? Happy birthday, Mel. Uh, let's all uh, wish Mel a happy birthday. Uh, Pauline says family, dyna family dynamics should be taken into consideration. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Leah says he was supposedly possessive and jealous, according to her journals. But no, we, we're not going to pay attention to that. Let's just um, let's focus on him, what he says. And, um, and and let's look at the DNA kind of thing. Okay. Have you got that, Deborah? Cool. Okay. If you need me to give you a link, I, I can do that if you can't find it. So I want to show you guys this highlighted section. I think it's from Vox. Can you guys see that? Listening to Serial, the whole for me has always been motive. Adnan's motive for killing Hay never made much sense. None of his friends thought he acted particularly badly. He reacted particularly badly to the breakup. Now, someone said earlier, I think it was Britscreek, said, I didn't find uh, Serial particularly pro-Adnan. You know, I didn't, I didn't get that impression. Well, somebody else is saying... When I listened to Serial, I never got a sense of his motive. It never made sense to me. So I was listening to Serial and I never really got the sense that that there was a motive there. And guess who is narrating Serial in a, in a big way? Adnan. It's about him. It's about his voice. Do you think Adnan is going to be in a documentary about him, in a podcast about him, in a story about him? Do you think he's going to say... You know what, um, you know, you're talking about motive. Let me share what my motive could have been. Do you think he's going to answer that? Was he going to say, you know, I was a really balanced guy and I had lots of girlfriends and I actually really like Heyman Lee. I didn't mind her breaking up with me and going out with another guy. I didn't mind that she kind of got a job and uh, was dating a white guy who was, you know, three, four years older than me. I didn't feel threatened by that at all. In fact, I was very pleased for her. And I told her that, uh, and I said, you know, I'm so happy for you, and we both moved on with our lives, right? So I'm not surprised that the whole, the whole in serial has been motive. I'm not surprised by that. Uh, okay, so just give me a second, Deborah. I'll put a link. The thing is, Deborah, you're in Australia, right? So let me just do the following. Um, just give me a second. Um, uh, okay, so that's .co .com .au, right? Hope that's going to work. So there you go. This is for you, Deborah. There's the um, there's the link. That's to the first book, but it's actually a five book series. So so if you're interested, just maybe you might want to keep this somewhere. You can keep the. Um, the link to the five book series as well. There it is. I must say this could be quite a good uh, topic for book club is this particular case, which I sat in on. It could definitely be quite, quite worthwhile. Okay, let's get back to our story. So now we're going to deal with someone else. 
And remember, we are trying to anally fixate on DNA. If the DNA is not there, well, then you're innocent, right? The DNA is not there, so Adnan's innocent. Well, we've now um, we've now looked at um, Scott Peterson. Well, he should be innocent. We've looked at Henry von Bredow. Well, there's disputed DNA. He should be innocent. And now we're going to look at Jody Arias. What's the DNA narrative in the Jody Arias case? Do you guys uh, have any idea what it might be? Well, let's have a look. So as an introduction to what we're saying here, uh, true crime seems to be suffering from extremely fragmented, distracted thinking at the moment. Now, I don't think it's just true crime. I think it's it's uh, beyond that. DNA is, did you know this? DNA has been recovered from a 70,000-year-old Neanderthal fossil, right? So you can get DNA, you can recover DNA from a fossil that's 70,000 years old. You kind of do need the DNA to sort of be sort of inside a tooth or or inside a bone or something like that. You can't have it just sort of lying out um, in a field, right? But it is possible for DNA to actually stand the test of time. Now, sometimes it does seem that DNA is incredibly resilient to the passage of time. And so you might say, if someone committed a crime, their DNA is there. If someone didn't commit a crime, their DNA is there. And I think that tends to be the position that many uninformed people take. If you're sitting in court and you're making the case that DNA makes or breaks the case in the Scott Peterson case, the West Memphis Three case, this Chris Watts case, and the Adnan Syed case, um, when do you actually start to talk about those things that destroy DNA? So, so you, um, it's fine to have the conversation where you say, the DNA makes or breaks the case. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So when you have the conversation and you and then you also say, well, if the person's DNA is there, they did it. And if it's not there, they didn't do it. At what point do you have the conversation where you say, um, uh, um, what about those things that destroy DNA? Do you guys know what they are? Sunlight, ordinary sunlight destroys DNA. Water, ordinary water destroys DNA. Simple environmental factors like heat and humidity destroy DNA. Bleach and soap very effectively destroy DNA. When do you hear about those conversations taking place? So it's, it's quite simple. You say, that person's DNA is not there, so they didn't commit the crime. But when do you have the conversation where you say, well, couldn't that person have destroyed the DNA that's there? And then you kind of have another argument, which is, shouldn't there be DNA there? And the problem is that there's absolutely no DNA there, or there's very little DNA there. Um, like the absence of evidence is also evidence. Um, in the Meredith Kircher Villa, there was like virtually no fingerprints, as far as I can remember. I'm not saying none, but virtually no fingerprints in the entire house. That's kind of odd. Uh, you'd expect to find fingerprints. Anyway, let's um, let's come back to this. Um, not sure why my eyes are not doing too well today. So, if a perpetrator has extended private time with human remains. They have extended private time to cover up, remove, or destroy evidence. Do you guys agree with that? And Jody Arias is a good example of someone who had an extended period of time with her victim. Henry van Breda is a good example of someone who had an extended period of time, although it didn't seem like he did much with it. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of a couple of others. Um, Although I think Henry did go into the shower. That's one of the places he went. He went into the bathroom. Um, Scott Peterson had a very extended time with Lacey Peterson as well. So, um, yeah, one fingerprint. Thanks. It's good to have you here, Cotton Star. So, again, if a perpetrator's got an extended private time with human remains, then why on earth would you expect 
there to be DNA? Would you think that the person just sat there and read the newspaper or uh, read a book or something? What, what would he do with that extended time? Well, what did, what did she do? What did, um, what did Jody Arias do with her extended time? Anybody know? So she's a really good example. What did Jody Arias do with her extended time with the victim? Well, let's have a look. <clears throat> in the Jody Arias case, the victim who was found in a shower stall had none of the perpetrator's DNA. Well, that must mean Jody Arias didn't commit the crime. So what had actually happened is she'd killed Travis in a hallway, and it was actually kind of quite a bloodbath. And it was a very bloody and brutal um, murder. But then she dragged Travis's body to the shower stall. And what did she do, do there? She washed her DNA off him. And she successfully washed her DNA off him, basically just using water. I don't know if she used soap, but um, she managed to get rid of evidence of her. And so since none of Jody's DNA was found on Travis's body, does that mean we should exonerate JD, Jody Arias right now. Jody, um, Jody's DNA wasn't found on Travis Alexander. Doesn't that mean she's innocent? Because it's the same thing with Adnan Sayed. His DNA wasn't there. So isn't Jody Arias actually innocent? And as Cotton Star says, she took a picture of it. They found a camera. So I also wrote a couple of books about the Jody Arias case. And the fact is they did find DNA, not in the shower, not on his body. They found it in a mixed uh, palm print. So there's a bloody palm print in the hallway where they found Jody's blood or Jody's DNA mixed with Travis's DNA. And that was something I guess she overlooked, right? The point I'm trying to make is she successfully got rid of her DNA by washing him down but her DNA still was somewhere else. But the point is she did get rid of her DNA on him in the shower. This is the bloody palm print, I think. It says here, a bloody palm print was discovered along the wall in the bathroom hallway. It contained DNA from both Arius and Alexander. So in cases like this, where questions around the absence of DNA um, evidence, excuse me, I, I think that's quite misguided. How is the absence of DNA evidence in a cover-up scenario evidence of innocence and not evidence of a cover-up? Are you guys following what I'm saying there? Let me put that in chat. Susanna Santos, good to see you. Let me put that up. How is the absence of DNA evidence in a cover-up scenario? What is a cover-up scenario? Well, it's where you find the victim's body after an extended period of time. That's, that's it's as simple as that. Where there's opportunity um, for getting rid of evidence, right? Where there's an opportunity to cover up. And so that's the part that is so weird. When there's an opportunity to cover up, don't you kind of go, was there a cover up here? I'm talking about evidence, not the way true crime likes to think, law enforcement's covering this up, or um, I don't know, the, the sheriff's office is trying to cover it up. Normally cover-ups happen when a criminal is doing something. And that's a, that's a cover-up that we sort of tend to explore in true crime. Not the Stephen Avery level cover-up where it's a big conspiracy. That, that is the new true crime where everything is a conspiracy. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Uh, no DNA or fingerprints in the Zao case. Stephanie says, I know I'm late, so I may have missed the discussion, but it is so frustrating that prosecutors seem not to follow through with the cases. Why is it seeming to happen more and more? 
Well, I think part of that question is, what do prosecutors have to gain by taking a narrative or taking a case to a popular conclusion, a conclusion that's going to make them popular? What, what do they have to gain? What does anyone have to gain by giving someone what they want? Isn't the answer popularity? Okay. So um, let me keep this up. That uh, that particular slide. So what I'm seeing more and more in true crime is that evidence no longer matters, facts no longer matter, proper reasonable arguments no longer matter. What matters now is being on a particular side that a narrative wants to go. Once upon a time, one of the most obvious reasons someone could be involved in a crime is when they just didn't, they couldn't give a consistent story. So was Adnan Syed's story consistent? I don't know. I don't know the case well enough. I don't know what version he gave. I haven't really studied his statements. Um, I know a witness's story wasn't consistent. But the point is consistency was also a problem regarding the state's case because the state fielded a particular theory. And so as a result of that, they also had to prove it and they were unable to do that. That either means the theory is incorrect or Adnan Syed is actually innocent. Which do you think it is? Let me put that in chat. Either the state's theory of what, what actually went down is incorrect or Adnan is innocent. Which one do you think it is? And that kind of brings us back to the poll. The poll is, Adnan Syed was wrongfully convicted. Does that mean he was wrongfully imprisoned? So far, 63% of you are saying yes. Well, we'll deal with that a little bit later on. Okay, let's get back to uh, the script here. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to put up this link. Can you guys see that? Now, according to this article in EW.com, from EW.com, the state claimed that uh, the state claimed that that Syed killed Lee by 2:36 p.m., placed her body in the trunk of her of her Nissan Sentra, removed her four to five hours later, and then buried her at about 7 p.m. That was the state's case. That's quite specific. Killed Lee at 2.36, buried her at 7 p.m. That's very specific. Now, obviously, if he played, um, what did I write here? If he, um, sorry, if he placed her in the trunk of his vehicle, right? She was placed in the trunk of her vehicle. But if he, if he placed her in the trunk of his vehicle, finding her DNA would have been more likely and more problematic. But finding her DNA in her own vehicle is not such a big deal. Anyway, vehicles, as in the case of Letitia Stork, can also be cleaned. So if you say, well, I didn't find DNA in the vehicle, does that mean the person wasn't in the vehicle? Well, the other thing is, was there time to clean the vehicle? <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, quite weird. So um, this is going back to the, the same article here. Um, and it sort of talks about a few things. It, it's sort of making the case for uh, for um, Adnan, I think. So it says here, on February 9, Lee was found buried on her right side in Leakin Park. If her body was contorted for four to five hours before death, Lee should have displayed some lividity on her side. In other words, they are attacking the state's case, saying, you said this time, you said that was going on, while well, the post, the, the autopsy doesn't show that. So it's not saying, it's not, it's not, um, it's not really um, fielding Adnan's case, it's attacking the state's case. Do you see what I'm saying? And who would know better than anyone than Adnan himself? Well, let me put it another way. If somebody commits a crime and someone is trying to um, uh, 
present an apology or present a defense case? Who would know better than the perpetrator what the, what the prosecution's case has gotten wrong because he was there? Who would know better what aspects to focus on that, that have to be wrong because of time problems and because of other problems? Well, the, the person that was there, right? Can you see how um, things always are kind of against the prosecution? Things are always actually against justice. Even when you get justice, it's kind of a watered down, not very satisfying justice. In the Nicholas Cruz sentencing, you had one juror that, that um, I guess, dissented, that voted um, in a different direction. Um, so anyway, Stephanie says, can you imagine if the Stephen Avery documentaries led to him being free? Yeah. It's exactly the same thing. It is a popular narrative that starts to dictate the narrative and then eventually starts to change a legal outcome to rapturous applause. It's the court of public opinion trumping the actual court. And it happens more often than you, than you may think, than you may imagine. So going back to this article, Let's just bring up another image. According to the autopsy report, lividity was present and fixed on the anterior surface of the body, except in areas exposed to pressure. Several medical experts who viewed the report said Hayes' lividity indicates she was placed face down and stretched out soon after her death and remained in that position for at least 8 to 12 hours before being buried. So the impression one has here, um, sorry, let's do it like that. The impression that one has here Okay, <laughs> digital things are quite um, temperamental, is that the perpetrator had access to human remains for at least eight hours. What did Jodie Arias do while she had access to human remains? What did the perpetrator in the Lee murder do with his access? Can I be honest? I have a very fleeting knowledge of the Adnan Syed case. Also, my impression of the prosecutor is that she's quite young. Just my impression. Um, sorry, let me... Um, let me bring up this image, this, that image. She's the prosecutor. Um, not that youth is a disqualifying factor for good lawyering, just that youth can be ambitious and ambitious prosecutors in a high profile case that's begging not to be prosecuted, see where this is going. So here's another headline from the Baltimore Sun. Uh, what's going on here? Judge rules prosecutors can't mention previous investigations of Marilyn Mosby at her criminal trial. What's this? Adnan Syed was exonerated, but questions remain for her family. Let's go back to that article. So this is quoting from that article. A federal judge barred prosecutors Wednesday from mentioning any of the previous investigations in Bal into Baltimore State's, Baltimore State's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, at her perjury and mortgage fraud trial later this month. When was later this month? Well, it was September 8th, 2022. That was barely a month ago. And this is the prosecutor who has not brought charges against Adnan Syed, and everyone's very, very happy about that. And so it also says here, um, it's making it harder for the government to introduce Mosby's previous comments about her side business. U.S. District Court Judge Lydia K. Grigsby said during the first of two pretrial hearings, 
that any mention of previous investigations into Mosby would be very prejudicial at trial. So it's quite interesting how, if you just think about it in a broad way, you've got a prosecutor and the whole thing is they're saying, you may not talk about um, her previous, um, previous investigations, right? Now in the Adnan Syed case, well, that's exactly what you're doing. You're talking about previous things that happened with the benefit of hindsight. Well, is that going to be prejudicial to the case? Mm, wonder, I wonder. Um, anyway, it's just funny how the, the tide turns, isn't it? So this is um, another article. Marilyn Mosby discusses election, the federal case and tension with the police union. Remember, this is um, the year that you have midterms in America. So I'm just going to quote uh, from that article. It says, Marilyn Mosby is seeking her third term as Baltimore City State Attorney and looking to hold off the same challenges she beat in 2018. What's the date of this? July 8th, 2022. Now it's happening kind of this year. Mosby told WJZ on Friday that she expects to prevail in the federal criminal case against her, which she is describing as politically motivated. So one does wonder, is the thing going on with Adnan Syed, is, that, is there something political there? Is that politically motivated? Has that become a bit of a political football where you gain points or you lose points? What do you think? Um, her court date, it says here, was September 19 on charges of perjury and falsifying information on a mortgage application. She says, I know I've done nothing wrong. And citizens of Baltimore City will see that for themselves. It goes on to say, Mosby rose to national prominence in 2015 when she announced charges against officers involved in Freddie Gray's arrest. Guess when 2015 was? One year after Serial kind of came into its own, right? Do you think Mosby paid attention to that much? Gray, um, so Freddie Gray died in police custody and then none of the six officers uh, charged were convicted. So she promised um, charges, well, there were charges, there were just never any convictions. Then Mosby said, we one of the first officers in the country to attempt to hold police officers accountable for the death of a black man. Now, I'm not, I don't really want to weigh into this, but I kind of get this sense of Mosby is actually targeting, or how can I put it? What I'm seeing in that headline is Mosby, um, uh, I guess, prosecuting policemen in the defense of a black guy. So it's almost like um, government or the police or the authorities are the bad guy and the sort of guy on the street, I don't want to say the criminal, but the, the, the guy on the street is the, the innocent victim, right? I'm just saying that's what I'm seeing through a very superficial reading of this. Now, in the John Bonet Ramsey case, you also had a sense that um, not prosecuting was part of a popularity contest and that the prosecutors in that case seemed to win that contest. In other words, by losing the case, they win popularity. So let me bring up another uh, headline. Um, Embattled Marilyn Mosby tries to fend off familiar rivals for third term as Baltimore State's attorney. This is um, also this year, July 2022. Mosby claims a 90% conviction rate, but that figure doesn't include the cases she's dropped before trial. Ever heard that before? Um, you know, if you think about the DA in the John Bonet Ramsey case, what is his conviction rate? It might have been 100% because he maybe didn't take any cases to trial and then he took one case to trial. I don't know. I don't quite know. Cotton Star might know what his conviction rate was. Um, she's built a national reputation as a leader in criminal justice reforms while her support locally has slipped. Now, I do think high enough profile cases can and do and have become political footballs. I don't know what you guys think. In the John Bonet Ramsey case, 
even the father of the victim attempted to go into politics. So I don't think you can make the case stronger than that. You have a high profile case and then the, I guess the former suspect tries to become a politician. Um, politics played a huge role in the Madeleine McCann case. It was also relevant in other cases like the Chris Watts case, Stephen Avery and even Suzanne Morphew. So again, quoting from this, the state's attorney for Baltimore, Marilyn Mosby, said that recently tested DNA completely exculpated Syed from the crime. His DNA was excluded, Mosby said. She declined to say if any other known suspects may be implicated in the recent DNA testing, saying that the investigation is ongoing. So it's kind of like, I don't know if she said that I can't talk about it, the investigation's ongoing, but it's kind of like a situation of all we did was we tested, we saw that Adnan Syed's DNA is not there, case closed, uh, and, and, and that's it. And as I say, um, that's a kind of a weird scenario from my perspective, because no DNA means no crime for Adnan Syed. Well, unless you're Heyman Lee, then, it, then you've, you felt the crime, you experienced the crime, then it was pretty real. So what I've tried to do in this, in this episode is try and show you how if you take the DNA narrative and you apply it in such a rigid way, how it would apply across many different cases, right? And how it is um, possibly misapplied in this case. She said, they tested DNA and that completely exculpated Syed from the crime. In other words, because his DNA is not there, he didn't commit the crime. So if we applied that to Scott Peterson, he didn't commit the crime. Susanna says, I'm catching your point. Okay. In other words, I'm saying this is reductionist and it's oversimplifying the case. That's what I'm trying to say. When a murder suspect, let me put this up. When a murder suspect is completely exculpated, a murder hasn't been solved. In fact, quite the opposite. It's been unsolved. But you wouldn't know it given social media cheering itself on for a job well done. And so there's more I want to talk about this. I really want to deal with this interview. It's a really interesting interview, um, part one, part two. But I'm going to not take it really further than that. I'm going to stop over here. I did a little poll, and I want to ask you guys what you think about this poll. So let me, um, I suppose it's okay like that. What do you guys think of that poll? Adnan Syed was wrongfully convicted. Does that mean he was wrongfully imprisoned? And so in this poll, 83% said yes. Let's see what it, what it is on YouTube. 60%. So 60%, also the majority, say if you're wrongfully convicted, that means you were wrongfully imprisoned. Do you agree with that? Do you guys agree with that? Give it a give it a few moments to think. Think about it. Does a wrongful conviction equal a wrongful imprisonment? What do you guys think? Let's let's hear it. Uh, Joan White says, I don't agree. Robbie says, no, I've changed my mind. I'm not, not quite sure what you're saying there. Stephanie says, I don't agree. Uh, Jennifer King says, yes. Angel does says, I don't agree with the poll. 
Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, yeah, it's an oversimplification on steroids in terms of what we said earlier. Uh, Sharon says, I actually do not know how to answer. SW Firefly says, I answered yes, but it doesn't mean he's not guilty. That's quite a good answer. So I think the easiest way to address this is to define wrongful conviction, right? So let's do that. Uh, wrongful conviction, let's, and I'm just getting a, a generic thing from Google. But when the person convicted is factually innocent of the charges, right? What do you think it means when you say someone's factually innocent? What, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that as a matter of law, um, they, weren't, um, they weren't found guilty, right? It means that um, there was insufficient evidence to prove that someone was guilty. Does that mean that they are innocent? It can mean that. But um, a wrongful conviction is basically, um, and, it, and it is often, and there it says, there could be procedural errors, and uh, sometimes you have a witness that, um, uh, over here it says, eyewitness error is a, is a great cause of wrongful convictions, right? You, you shouldn't always take Google's word as gospel, but in this case, it, it is accurate. But um, what I'm trying to get at is if, if um, legal protocols are sort of um, violated, then factually you, you, you couldn't convict that person. But that doesn't mean that they didn't commit the crime. It means you were unable to properly prosecute the case. In this case, it wasn't just the DNA. The other aspect, I think, was that um, ex uh, I think they said potentially exculpatory evidence wasn't handed over. And so that was also seen as a protocol violation. So if you think about it in a, in a very simple way, Adnan Sayed wasn't found innocent because, because they fundamentally found that he had an alibi or they fundamentally found um, that somebody else committed the crime or they fundamentally found that someone else's DNA was there and he had motive and he did commit the crime and they found the murder weapon. In other words, they didn't exclude him by including someone else. Um, they excluded him by sort of finding procedural problems like, oh, you should have handed that over, but you didn't. Okay. Um, oh, the DNA wasn't there. So, so it's kind of an um, after-the-fact way of prosecuting a case, and, um, and now, it's, now it's undone. Now there's going to be no case, right? Do you understand that? So um, a wrongful conviction doesn't mean you're not guilty. It means they failed to properly prove that you um, were guilty. Does that make sense? They fail to properly prove that you're guilty, but that doesn't mean that you are innocent. Right? So now we get on to uh, wrongful imprisonment. Wrongful imprisonment when a person is intentionally, uh, intentionally restricts another person from exercising his freedom. I don't really like uh, these definitions. It's not really what we want to look at. But basically, to address this, um, wrongful, a wrongful uh, conviction doesn't automatically equal wrongful imprisonment in the same way that your DNA not being there doesn't automatically mean you weren't there. Um, a wrongful conviction could be a procedural problem, but then the court case that took place at the time did have certain um, grounds, did have certain witnesses and certain evidence and certain um, uh, inculpatory evidence that got you into court in the first place. And you can argue afterwards that the cell phone pings are disputed, or you can argue this, or you can argue that, but at the time that he was prosecuted, 
Um, uh, the law went, I guess, as far as it could go, and and then he was imprisoned as a result of the outcome of that, right? The only way you can get restitution where you say it's wrongful imprisonment is if you can prove that you were innocent. So in other words, if Adnan Syed truly is innocent, and if those who, those supporters of his truly believe in his innocence, then they should really um, basically go, they should go to the effort to prove that. And they can then get a handsome multi-million dollar settlement, right? Um, it's quite a big if though. Uh, can they prove that he's innocent? I don't know. Um, but I think the bigger insight here is if they don't, if somebody doesn't, um, how can I put it? If someone doesn't try and make the case for wrongful imprisonment, what do you think that means? So if you went to jail ostensibly for 20, 22 years for a crime you didn't commit, and then you are let out on a technicality or you let out because of popular support and then you don't sue for wrongful imprisonment. What do you think that that means? So I don't know what the outcome is going to be here. I don't know whether he will. I think the important question to ask now is, will he? And if he doesn't, why isn't he? And also, if he doesn't, shouldn't social media put pressure on him to do that because it's not fair. He was in prison for 22 years. Uh, he should get something for that, right? Do you agree? Uh, if he's innocent and he shouldn't have been in prison, then he should sue for wrongful imprisonment, right? So so his um, the social media shouldn't stop where it stopped, should keep doing that. Do you guys agree? Okay, so... Remember, I said I want to bookend this discussion with this particular article. I'm going to bring it back. I'm going to just read this whole article. I'll put a link in the chat to it. It's quite well written. And I'm going to say I personally agree with the sentiment expressed here. Serial reveals how much more we care about justice for a man's life than for, a, for the life of a woman. Uh, Cyril is all about Adnan Syed. You never really hear about Heyman Lee. You ne never really hear about her. It says, as the podcast tries to investigate whether Adnan Syed killed Heyman Lee, a discrepancy emerges. It's so much easier to spot the cultural uh, misogyny when it's applied to race rather than gender. So I'm going to read this paragraph again. Cyril is the story of who killed Heyman Lee, a Baltimore high school student murdered in 1999, except Heyman Lee is dead and so unable to speak, and her family declined to participate in Sarah Koenig's investigative podcast. So instead, Cyril is the story of Adnan Syed, it's the story of the man convicted of her murder. In every episode, the first human voice we hear is Syed himself saying his own name, whether by default or design, he's the star. The question Serial asks most insistently is not who killed Lee, but did Syed do it? That's my biggest problem with this, is in true crime, well, the true crime that I am involved in, I want to know who committed this criminal act. Who is the murderer here? What did they do? Why did they do it? Who is it? When, where, what, how, why, all of that stuff, right? It's not the where you say, oh, Chris Watts killed uh, his family. Did he do it? And that becomes what you fixate on. Did Chris Watts do it? Uh, did he have help? Could it have been someone else? Could someone have influenced him and all the permutations of that? In other words, you're trying to kind of unsolve a crime. You're kind of trying to un, um, 
unravel something that has been um, dealt with, right? You're not asking, you're not trying to investigate a crime, you're trying to kind of nitpick a crime from this from one particular side. Then she says, the answer to that with one episode still to come is a big fat maybe, meaning did Syed do it? A big fat maybe with more than enough reasonable doubt to make Syed's conviction look shaky. Anyway, that's that's as far as I'm going to take it. But that is a fact, is he emerges as the star in his own story. And look where he is now. He's there. The star has been released. Look how happy social media is. Well done, social media. Well done. Let's just go through some of these images. Um, well, there are too many that are mixed up with, with sort of other images. Let's go to this end. So there you can actually see Syed amongst his peers. There's Woodlawn High School. Apparently, there's an, a second, I think, HBO documentary coming out. I think it's called The Case Against Adnan Syed, but it's it's kind of a, got a double meaning. It's, a, it's like the case against the case against Adnan Syed, I guess. That's how I understand it. Yeah, so from from this from this face to to that face. And so one wonders what is going to be the aftermath to the story. But in sum, what I really wanted to show you guys was, first of all, the anal sort of approach to DNA, which is far too narrow, in my opinion. And then also the way that uh, social media can become, you can either say it's a monster, or you can say it's this powerful force for good, which starts dictating legal outcomes. And you can say, does it do so intelligently? Is it really bringing about a force for change that is the right force for change? And then you might say, look at all these instances where social media changed the outcome for the better. And then my question would be, yeah, but how, how do you know? How do you know that it, it's, I know you wanted that outcome. I know it's the popular outcome, but how do you know that it's the right outcome? Does social media know that? Or does social media probably not know that? Okay, so I'm not going to take it further than that. Um, uh, Suri, Suri A says, I really enjoy getting together on these lives. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, uh, Stephanie says, I appreciate your comments. Um, not sure if I agree that she didn't want to get sued. I think, I think, um, so let me, um, let me share with you kind of how it works because I've seen this so many times in order to get the sort of access you want to a, a possible perpetrator in a high profile case. There's only one way you can do that. So Let's talk about a couple of high profile cases. John Bonet Ramsey, Madeleine McCann, Stephen Avery, West Memphis Three, Amanda Knox, et cetera, et cetera. What is common in all of those cases? Well, what's common in all of those cases is someone came along and made a documentary about these people or one of these people. And what do you think the, um, premise of the documentary was, well, we're going to, the sun is going to smile on you. We're going to tell your story on your terms. Well, is that really going to, is there going to be much critical thinking there? I mean, it, it, it suits me if you're going to, you know, um, interview me and tell me exactly what I want you to say. Um, so is, is that the condition upon which 
you have you 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 provide that access. Um, so in other words, someone gets access to you to a very high profile story that's very much in demand. Very many journalists want that access, but um, there are only so many journalists who who want to tell the story from a particular perspective. In other words, your perspective and the perspective that you're innocent. And you also want to maintain control that it's it's only really going to be that. There's not going to be too much, well, maybe this and maybe that and going into certain areas, right? Um, if you think about Chris Watts and the access that a certain author got to him, and then you can imagine the concern, well, are you going to tell my story in a way that's going to be favorable to me? Well, Chris Watts made a bit of a boo-boo there, but some other people... Um, didn't. Adnan Syed, in um, sharing his story with uh, this particular podcaster, um, there was definitely a, his story got told um, in, in a sort of preponderance way, like, um, how can I put it, uh, the majority of his story was, was, was sort of honoured. And that is Kind of how these stories work right so do you guys see how it works um so in other words you kind of have a defense case invariably you are not going to have someone who's accused of a crime just pouring their heart out to someone who's going to say you know what i, I think maybe they're not innocent there's, there's basically one exception to that and that was the jinx and look at what happened look what happened in that case i think Durst thought he was a lot cleverer than he than he really was, and he was pretty clever, but he um, kind of outfoxed himself. Okay, so that is it from me. Um, Su Susanna says, "Yeah, uh, Stephanie, are you feeling a lot better now?" Yeah, no one has been found guilty of all of those crimes. That's also a good point to make. So um, who did kill Heyman Lee? Does anybody care? It feels a bit like O.J. Simpson. Yay, O.J. Simpson's innocent. Okay, well, who, who then committed that double murder? I'm going to, don't worry, I'm going to investigate that for the rest of my life. Okay, while you're on a golf course um, in Florida, um, how are you investigating that? So, yeah, so um, is Terry here? I uh, think she is. Terry says, hey, gang, I'm at work, but popped in to say hello and hit the rocket button. And also, don't forget to put up hashtag team, um, team Peachtree. So what we're going to do tomorrow is we're going to do a special deep dive in the Kylie Rodney case. But with Terry on board, Terry should be in. Uh, it should be around about, I think, 1 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, what's the other thing? Terry's going to, Terry actually sent me a video that I've never seen before. Um, she sent it today. And uh, she, she titled the video, I think, Debunking Doug. And uh, it's, it's actually a really incredible video. It's just a video from the Prosser campground. And um, it really is really fascinating. It's fascinating to watch it. It's just about, I think, two minutes long. It's fascinating to watch it and fascinating to listen to Terry's words. So I'm looking forward to, um, to that sort of this time-ish tomorrow. So I hope you guys um, enjoy that and, and, and stay tuned for that. Okay, yeah, definitely. Uh, we also want to wish Mel happy birthday and um, and we're glad to see that Stephanie's feeling better. I, I suppose you ate a couple of peaches that made, made you feel better. Yeah, Jinx is a good example. Uh, that is exactly what you're talking about, making the suspect the star of the narrative. Um. Do you think, what do you think about that in this picture?
and of course she was present at the trial uh, she, she's like present in the photos of him coming out right um also right now do you, don't you think um the media and social media and and she herself see this as a victory for sort of true crime podcasts that that they can um change legal outcomes and, and and isn't that great um isn't that what everyone wants right i don't know i'm asking the question i, I don't really follow it so i don't really know what it is okay mel says i see politics with a capital p okay anyway uh brits creek you obviously have followed the serial thing i haven't but you obviously uh, would know a lot more about this stuff than I would. So uh, it was interesting having a, I don't want to say dissenter, but certainly having a um, someone with, with knowledge of that in chat. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about that um, because if you um, weren't sure someone was innocent, but you made sure you got their story and your story kind of tends to be sympathetic um, and you're getting millions and millions of views and ultimately more and more witnesses come forward, witnesses, um, uh, you know, maybe you say that, that but... Um, I think it's quite hard, and I think we see, we see this in true crime all the time. Um, when you when your income is based on your um, your bias, and the and your income is is being derived from a particular um, narrative that's either popular or not popular, I think that tends to inform your your motives, whether you like it or not. So anyway, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Um, but I'm always um, I'm always a little bit suspicious when people in true crime cover cases and they sort of say, you know what? I, I don't really have an opinion. I don't really know what to say. In other words, they are sort of sitting on the fence. So you've been studying a case for six to eight years, but you're not really sure what's going on. Mm, really. Um, I've seen someone who wrote about the Zahao case doing that. Um, I think those who covered the Stephen Avery case did the same thing, where they say, um, someone asked him a simple question, do you think X is guilty? No, I don't, I don't really want to think about that or talk about that. Um, we just really want to tell his story. Mm, really? Um, true crime is really about finding out and coming to a conclusion at the end of the day. I don't think people go to trial in order to come out with either a mistrial or a hung jury. That's not the point of taking cases to trial. The point is getting justice. The point is coming to a resolution. The point is um, uh, concluding something and getting some kind of closure, not going the whole time. I, I really don't know. I've been studying this for six or eight years and I'm really caught in between. Um, really? Anyway, uh, thanks a lot, Stephanie. Appreciate it. Uh, I will re rewatch the part that I missed. Tippy toeing, yeah. Playing it both ways is, is is another way of calling what sometimes happens with that. You, you sometimes see that because you don't want to disappoint part of your audience, and you also don't want to alienate your the star. You want to alienate your star. Anyway, um, okay, guys, I'm not going to take it further than that. I uh, hope you found this interesting. Um, Timmy is definitely enjoying the ASMR aspect. Uh, Mel, enjoy the rest of your birthday, and um, I'll see you guys next time. Au revoir. Ciao. Cheers, Bria. Um, all the best to you as well. Terry, see you tomorrow at, a, at sort of midday, 1 p.m. tomorrow. I'll see you then. Okay. Cheers, guys.